How many video game franchises can you name that span over 30 years? Maybe these? Or even this? I bet most people wouldn't think of Wasteland. Originally released in 1988, Wasteland was the first RPG to feature branching quests, consequences to your actions, and NPCs with realistic AI. It was a huge success, but soon after release, a sequel was cancelled by publishers Electronic Arts. Yep, EA were even being dicks in 1988. EA Games Cancel Everything With no sequel planned, Wasteland faded away, and studio head Brian Fargo moved on to his next post-apocalyptic RPG, Fallout. Over the years, as Fallout switched to the popular FPS genre and became more and more streamlined, Wasteland stayed true to its hardcore RPG roots. In 2014, 26 years after the release of the original game, Wasteland 2 surfaced following a $3 million Kickstarter campaign. But unlike in 1988, the success of Wasteland 2 did prompt a sequel and InXR Entertainment was purchased by Microsoft. As a result, more money was funneled towards the project, so surely, with more firepower and more money in the bag, Wasteland 3 will improve upon everything that dragged the previous title down. Well, after around 50 hours of the game, I can say this is mostly true. The new and improved combat system is enthralling, and the core RPG mechanics are as good as ever. There were issues with performance on launch, but unlike Wasteland 2, they don't detract from the overall experience. And thankfully, that experience is one of the most compelling and impactful RPGs released in recent memory. Not only is the narrative dark, dense and detailed, but it is filled with difficult choices and long-lasting consequences. In the end, you're forced to bear witness to these consequences and consider if everything you did was worth it. But similar to actual life, nothing is simple and nothing is ever perfect. Wasteland 3 starts as you enter a chilly Colorado, following a distress signal from the head of state, the Patriarch. It's revealed that his three children have gone AWOL and are planning to end his reign of power. If you agree to help the Patriarch and round them up, in return he'll send supplies back to your allies in Arizona, saving them from imminent starvation. You get the main missions at the start of the game, but they're level gated so you can't actually start them for another 10 hours or so. This means that the initial hours are spent running other missions and levelling up your characters. You can explore all of Colorado, using your half truck half tank the Kodiak, but you can't pass through certain zones due to radiation clouds. This might raise an initial red flag, as some RPGs are known for containing excess filler quests. Thankfully though, that's not the case here, as all of the missions are of an extremely high calibre. I never felt like any missions were included to pad out the playtime, as each was fleshed out and nicely detailed. I think the main reason for this is because the missions always have three layers to them. They're set in interesting locations, the premise is always intriguing, and there are additional plot points to add more depth. If we look at one of the early missions, you enter an area called the Garden of the Gods to confront the Dorseys, a brutal gang of raiders who infiltrated Colorado Springs. So we have an intriguing location as the Garden is a high-tech farm, we have an intriguing premise as we need to defeat the Dorseys, but what about the extra layer? Well, the family of a squad member was kidnapped by the Dorseys, and now she wants answers. This not only led to some heartbreaking moments, but the interweaves layered structure amplifies every single mission in Wasteland 3. It is simply exceptional. But I'm not worried, as long as I got my buddy Clarence here. Clarence? Clarence? Admittedly, the main narrative is simple. After all, you're just rounding up three people. But the simplicity of the narrative serves to create a framework around which interesting stories can be told. Rather than focus on why the Patriarch's children have fled, or explaining their ideologies in great detail, the narrative looks inwards as we examine the Patriarch himself, and primarily, how he keeps peace in Colorado. One way this is achieved is by using the subplot involving the Patriarch's brutal war against the gangs of the Eastern Plains. The gangs are barbaric and use excessive force against anyone who opposes them, including the people of Colorado Springs. The Patriarch's war suppresses the gangs, but as with most things in Wasteland 3, there are consequences to his actions. In this case, the consequences are refugees. We're refugees, every one of us, driven off our land by the Plains gangs. This is a brilliant inclusion as it sets the theme and tone of the entire game. You want to do the right thing, but you constantly have to balance your ethics with the reality of this post-apocalyptic world. And more importantly, 
by your deal with the Patriarch. Want to overthrow a crazy faction? I wouldn't do that as they control the Patriarch's fuel supply. Want to eliminate a psychopath who kills people for fun? Go ahead, but that's the Patriarch's son. Want to provide asylum for the refugees? You can, but it may come at the expense of the Patriarch's citizens. Considering we too are in the midst of our own refugee crisis, I imagine these are the types of decisions that world leaders make on a daily basis. And Wasteland 3 shows us how difficult and just how far compromised these decisions are. It's an extremely powerful message and not many games leave an impact like this. But that's Wasteland for you. It's brutal. You're forced to make imperfect decisions in an imperfect world. A lot of the time you'll enter a situation with your choices pre-planned, but in the moment, doubt starts to creep in. This feeling is frequently played upon as InXR presents us with both sides of every argument and makes the motives behind each character clear. In Wasteland, no person is evil for the sake of being evil. They're usually fighting for something, someone, or simply to survive. The quality of writing is that strong that I often found myself empathising with each faction, including the Dorseys who murdered groups of innocent people. It would have been easy for InXR to present the Dorseys as generic villains, but like in every aspect of the game, depth is applied here too. It turns out Colorado Springs fired first, so who is really the villain here? The muddied waters surrounding every situation like this make it difficult to make the right choice. No matter what, all of your actions have consequences and siding with one person over another can easily backfire. Cross a faction and they'll dislike you, and they'll make sure you know about it too. You'll be abused in the streets. How are you rangers any different from mercs? Refuse trade. Can't expect me to sell to you after what you've done. And even have dialogue options unavailable in conversation. It reinforces that feeling of consequence, as no matter where you go, you're constantly reminded of your mistakes. This system is probably most similar to Fallout New Vegas or The Outer Worlds, but rather than have fame and infamy, everything you do is added to a fame meter. It's an interesting mechanic and InXL implements it in ingenious ways. For example, as you explore, random NPCs will recognise you as the legend of your mission spreads across the state. And in some rarer cases, enemies will refuse to fight you when they realise you're the mighty Desert Rangers. Oh shit! It's the Desert Rangers! Pull back! Do not engage! The Patriarch can keep this money! There are many more examples of this, but it was always impressive every time fame was used. It was never a throwaway feature as most of these moments had gameplay implications too. When I avoided that battle, it was at the end of a tough mission, where one more fight could have tipped me over the edge. If my fame wasn't high enough here, I would be forced to fight or to try and use my key skills to bypass the encounter. But as Wasteland 3 adds steps to everything in the game, that would have been a viable option. One of my squad members had points in Kiss-Ass, which could be used to turn the enemy against each other. Don't listen to them! We outnumber them two to one! Another member was an explosive specialist, who one time disarmed a bomb to literally defuse a hostile situation. Of course, this will all sound familiar if you're a fan of these types of games, but Wasteland 3 goes above and beyond other modern RPGs. In games like Fallout, it doesn't really matter if you can't unlock a high level safe, but here, failing a skill check means you could be locked out of key content. One of these moments even had an impact on the ending of the game, which is just mind-blowing. It's an incredibly ballsy move to lock features away, but I appreciated how it encouraged multiple playthroughs just to experience everything. So I've mentioned how brutal Wasteland 3 is, which you'd think would make playing through the game incredibly dark. Well actually, that's not the case, as the dark themes are contrasted perfectly with comedy, ranging from the absurd to the outright weird. I personally loved how certain NPCs were given joke names, like a member of the Mafia, Joey Bag of Donuts. Hey, it's the Rangers! Or how a lot of humour revolves around the inhabitants of this post-apocalyptic world, trying to understand our pre-apocalyptic world. One section in particular shows a robot archaeologist trying to figure out what humans use this unusual artefact for. Completion time is 30 seconds. Sure, these are small details, but larger parts of the game are designed with humour in mind, including the key factions. I think the best example of this is the Monster Army, a faction who have designed their uniform around a cheesy Halloween theme. They all wear plastic wolf masks after watching the 1980s classic movie, Teen Wolf. Yep, that's actually in the game. For one side mission, you even visit their old bunker and retrieve the DVDs for their leader. 
an obese man in a Dracula costume called Flab the Impaler. Another faction, the Gippers, rivaled the monster army for sheer absurdity. The Gippers control the Patriarch's fuel supply, but they also worship a robotic Ronald Reagan who vaporizes communists with his laser beam eyes. Communist. Communist. Both are fine examples of the exceptional writing in Wasteland and the talents at In Exile. Not only can they create depth in their drama, but they provide humour to rival the best across all entertainment genres. If you're a fan of comedies like Rick and Morty, then you will most definitely like the humour here. If you're not, then that's okay too, as the humour never outstays its welcome. It seemed like for every great joke, there was equally great gameplay to follow. As an example, the Gipper missions, which are absurd throughout, have dense RPG choices within them to add weight to the situation. Mainly, do you work with them or wipe them out, and what becomes of Robot Reagan? During my playthrough, I chose to wipe them out, but I also forgot to disable Ronald Reagan, which led to an epic fight on the outskirts of Denver. This was such a memorable and quite frankly bizarre encounter that it stood out across the entire game. In fact, I'd say that due to the unique premise of every encounter, they all stood out from the next. I'm not sure many other games could say the same. Even in XCOM, which the combat system is based on, every city or woodland locale blends into the next. But here, every single encounter oozes with environmental and strategic variety. One arena may have cover down both sides, allowing your squad to split up, while another has minimal cover, putting you on the back foot. And like in the best games, this variety is designed around a simple loop. In essence, you need to dispatch your enemies as efficiently as possible to avoid burning through supplies. Failing to do so not only risks failing the mission, but it creates difficult situations to overcome. If you're low on supplies and far away from a vendor, then it could be game over if your squad dies. It's such a simple premise, but during long missions it creates a large amount of tension. It makes every encounter gripping as you carefully plan out each preceding move. However, I did notice this system falter during the game's final act. If you complete most missions then your squad will be overpowered by the end. You can take down enemies easily, and you'll likely have an almost endless supply of health packs. If you have a perk in the barter skill, you can even sell expensive antiques, meaning money isn't a problem. This was on the recommended difficulty by the way, so it's probably not an issue the higher you go. Other things like audio bugs in combat were common, specifically if a leader revived a teammate, or when fighting Scorpitrons. I mentioned during the introduction that the performance of Wasteland 2 hindered the game, and that hopefully things were different in Wasteland 3. Well, the performance is much better here, the frame rate is steady, there are minimal bugs, and there are loads of quality of life improvements to make the game more accessible. Even little improvements like the option to loot all bodies in one go, or not having to select individual squad members for a skill check are great. However, on launch there were still issues. For one, the crashes. How many times do you think the game crashed over 50 hours? Seriously, have a guess. I'll wait a few seconds. Ready? 43. It crashed 43 times. That's almost a crash every half an hour of gameplay. Some crashes even came towards the end of a tough encounter forcing me to restart. I'd lost about 30 minutes of progress and was forced to sit there and watch the painfully long loading screens. It's surprising that the performance is inconsistent, as Wasteland 3 isn't exactly a graphical powerhouse. In Exile chose to go with a more realistic presentation, which is fine, but the graphics need to be exceptional to pull it off. In other games which have a realistic presentation, like Red Dead Redemption 2 or The Last of Us 2, the graphics are genre-defining, and in games where the graphics are average, like Fallout 4, the art style makes up for its shortcomings. I can't say either about Wasteland. The textures in particular are garishly bad, even in main areas of the game. Like the floor texture at the Ranger headquarters, it was atrocious on Xbox One. This is also a key area of the game, so I don't understand why more effort was put into making it pop. Perhaps I'm nitpicking, as Wasteland 3 can look good. There were multiple times when lighting breathed life into an area, especially where colourful neon illuminated the landscape. The new cinematic camera also utilised lighting to create impressive visuals like the first time the Patriarch's daughter ambushes you with headlights in the background. This cinematic camera is a first for Wasteland, but it's used in almost every other RPG, which usually zooms in on an NPC's face for all conversations. 
I do find this quite bland elsewhere, as everything is extremely static. In Wasteland 3 though, there have been substantial improvements to push this aspect of RPGs forward. Rather than just zoom in, these scenes are dynamic and heavily animated. You'll notice this instantly with the over-exaggerated facial animations, but the inclusion of action within a scene was the most impressive. People get shot, shot at, and move all over the place. It's a great achievement and I hope future RPGs incorporate this going forward. In an ideal world, I suppose this cinematic camera would be used for every single conversation, as currently, it's used for key conversations or to introduce key characters. This means during most conversations you're stuck with a static, isometric camera, with all emotions being conveyed through the voice acting. Thankfully, the voice acting and scripts are exceptional, so this isn't a huge issue. I'll be the keeper of my own conscience, thank you. I am a grown woman. You have no right to make these decisions for me. I... Forgive me. And really, nothing in Wasteland 3 is. For everything in Exile attempts, they unquestionably succeed. The combat is the best the series has ever been and it stands shoulder to shoulder with the squad based games it's based upon. Every encounter was strategically complex due to the many handcrafted arenas and simple combat loop. As the combat has borrowed mechanics from other successful games, it would have been easy for the rest of the game to follow suit. But rather than take a more streamlined approach, Wasteland 3 stays true to its roots. Over its 50 hour playtime, we're forced to operate in morally grey areas make tough decisions and bear witness to their long-lasting consequences. By the premise alone, we are pinned into a corner with the weight of Colorado and Arizona resting heavily on our shoulders. In the end, Wasteland 3 highlights how difficult and how far compromised these decisions are to create an impact that many pieces of entertainment struggle to leave. This is a monumental achievement for the RPG genre and a game I'm glad I had the opportunity to play in my lifetime. And the fact that it's really funny too <laughs> It's the ranges! That's just a huge bonus. Thanks for watching my review of Wasteland 3, and see you on the next one. <laughs> <laughs>